subscription just hope that you enjoyed this rare and infamous moment that combines a first-rate disaster with genuine historical significance. But now it's time to take a deep breath and get those cameras out as we prepare to temporally reset you to one of the most fantastic catastrophes in history. Are you ready? everyone, and welcome to a Time Shifters podcast. This is your host, Christopher, and I am here not only with Tom. Howdy. Hi, Tom. How you doing? Good. How are you? We are welcoming back for this special episode, former host, Matt. Matt, welcome back. Hey, thanks for having me. It's been a long time. Skype is telling me it's been over a year already. Yeah, because what, we did it two years ago, I think? It must be. Falling it was like- Down? Was, it was that the down? last that what we... time we did it as a trio? I think that, that I was there. Huh. Interesting. Well, it has been a while. We're glad yeah. to have you back. I, I was under the assumption because we ended that episode with me saying, oh, we need to do Godzilla 98. And then you were like, you know what? No. And I was like, ah, I'll never <laughs> <be back." laughs> I love torturing Chris with uh, Godzilla 98. <laughs> Oh yeah, I learned nope, that nope. one real quick. <laughs> no, you you made me watch the movie that shall not be named. I am not going to watch that movie now, too. <laughs> oh come on, it, it it could fit snugly into this year's. <laughs> no, no. I mean, no. it Doesn't, did look pretty. It did look no, pretty. No, it was horrible. It was ugly. It was terrible. <laughs> hey, I I did Transformers, so. <laughs> <laughs> we did do transformers right and and we're debating whether or not this uh special this uh, sneak in of willow is going to save me from having to watch star trek so <laughs> speaking of watching stuff tom and I, I, matt i don't know if you're familiar with this series or not i started re-watching the old star blazers yes no i don't know that one you don't know okay. star blazers that was, uh, for many folks here in the U.S., that was probably their, their first venture into anime. Came oh, in around the why. same time as the Voltron and, and well, just prior to Transformers and that, which is essentially a ripoff of anime. Hmm. Right. Yeah, Star Blazers is an Americanized version of a cartoon called Space Battleship Yamato. And... I haven't watched these things in ages. I'm amazed how entertaining these stupid things still are. (laughs) It's actually not too bad. I was expecting it to be a lot worse because I knew it was re-edited and kind of and redubbed for American audiences Mm. and everything. But they actually still put together a fairly decent story with those things. It's some pretty solid sci-fi all the way around. I mean... And it hits on some of the best tropes. I mean, Earth is brain- teetering on the brink of destruction. It requires a brave crew and a soul ship with technology they don't fully understand to go out and battle on an entire civilization against their one ship. Even though it has been softened and stuff for the u.s audience and everything it still does deal with a lot with uh with loss with death mm-hmm. uh, some pretty heavy themes and yeah it's it's been a lot of fun to this day i still believe the second season of enterprise is entirely based off the first season of star blazers that's probably not entirely wrong yeah that notion of the soul ship going to save the entirety of humanity <laughs> right <laughs> My uh, my son came in and asked what I was watching, and I just finished an episode. I was like, oh, well, here, I'll, I'll tell you what it's all about. And I just played the intro, which has that fantastic song that it pretty much explains the entire plot of the of the season. Mm-hmm. And I uh, mentioned that, you know, they did a live-action film a few years ago, and, and I'll probably be watching that later this year if you wanted to watch it. And he's like, it is a pretty cool-looking ship. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, it is a very cool looking ship. It's probably my second favorite to Enterprise. I've always been in love with it, but battleships themselves look just impressive unto themselves. So the notion of literally converting one for space travel 
was yes. just too much. I mean, it's an awesome, and I they put a little thought into it. Granted, all still fairly far fetched, but I mean, the the notion that it actually had wings to come out to stabilize it in an atmosphere and all that. You like those little touches? Those are fun. Yeah, yeah, it's been fun. Something else I've been doing, not watching, but reading. I've been I picked up Confessions of a Puppet Master, the autobiography of Charles Band. Okay. Uh, the the man behind Empire Pictures and Full Moon Entertainment. Yep. Some people are gifted, and some are just lucky. Charles Band is likely both, <laughs> <laughs> and and argu- arguments can be made exactly on how much of which really explains his life. <laughs> It's a really fun read. Uh, don't imagine you've you've read that, Tom, but I would actually really recommend it. It's really interesting. Just his life reads like make believe. You you read it and you're thinking that didn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> what is it? The life of the guy that no matter what he steps in a pile of dog do pulls out a hundred dollar bill. <laughs> exactly, exactly. He he'd step in a wad of gum and it would pick up a fifty dollar bill. Yes. <laughs> yeah. But just, he is kind of like a uh, a version of Roger Corman when you read some of the stuff, when he, he talks about these little-known actors that he got to do in his film, and they turn out to be Demi Moore. They turn out to be <laughs> Richard Mull. You know, they turn out to be, uh, just, you name it. You know, he's buddies with uh, John Carpenter before John Carpenter was John Carpenter, and uh, that sort of thing. It's just, Stan Winston, you know, actually did work for him early on. Even when Stan Winston was up and coming, He's, he's like, oh no, you're a, you're a friend. I'll I'll whip something together for me in, in my garage and bring it over and <laughs> do it so they could do this this film. It, incredible! It's really amazing. What's the title of that again? Confessions of a Puppet Master. Definitely gonna have to check that out. Matt, what have you have you been watching? Anything interesting? So yeah, just several movies here and there. Like I just saw the new Super Mario Brothers movie uh, yesterday. I've heard I've heard good. I really enjoyed it. I had a lot of fun cool. with it. You know, it, it's it it brought back the it, the near extinct ninety minute movie, which is <laughs> always I'm always a fan of that. It it tells a pretty good story, um, riddled with references right from the start. Like the movie, the the first scene with Mario and Luigi opens with a commercial of their new plumbing business, and it's doing the Mario Brothers rap from the 80s live action show (laughs) wow and that's their commercial and i'm like okay they are going to go on a journey with these references and like one after the other but it's not like thrown at your face it's more of just if you get it you get it and if you don't you don't and it's just part of what's either in the background or who they have cameo do being a cameo like you find out mar and luigi have gone out to start their own plumbing business and they just left the wrecking crew and i'm like oh my god that's oh, so great <laughs> nice yeah but does it compare it to the bob hoskins john leguizamo film uh it's definitely <laughs> more entertaining and more like the video game <laughs> uh, i'm still a little trouble that uh, john leguizamo actually ha- had a little bit of a beef over this film uh, and, and some of it was related to just um Latino representation, which it has people, but I mean, he was impersonating an Italian plumber. Right. So right. I'm not <laughs> sure where the representation part was gone, had and, gone awry. And they go to a fictional world where everybody's a talking mushroom. <laughs> yes. <laughs> there is that. And they meet Lance Henriksen in the end. Actually, I don't think they ever meet him. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> I don't, I'm like the only, I'm the holdout. I'm the one person that I think I've ever met that actually enjoys that film. <laughs> I I enjoy it for nostalgia because I was very young when that came out. So like I was the right age of who this movie was meant for. So I can look at it and get those feelings back. But I also can look at it and go, but it's crap. <laughs> <laughs> it might be why I like it. <laughs> I, I understand Bob and John were uh, more or less uh, tanked the entire way through the filming of that. <laughs> Wouldn't surprise me. You, Tom, you been up to anything interesting? Uh, no, I, 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 I've been traveling on business, so oh. to the, uh, 
the beautiful reaches of Omaha, Nebraska. <laughs> oh, fun! Uh, it, an interesting and enter- uh, an interesting city. Uh, I have never seen a place so nice, clean, well put together. Looks practically brand new, and nobody's there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's why it looks new and so clean. Yeah, r- rush hour was like five cars coming down the street at the same time. <laughs> Mm-hmm. It would be a perfect place to film, like, you know, what if everyone vanished one day? I abs- <laughs> it absolutely would. I mean, people might be in the buildings, but you'd have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> That's where they, 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 someone will go and film one of the, some post-rapture film. I, I found it particularly bizarre. So f- the view from my hotel room was into the courtyard where there's another large building right there. And they had like a giant, like it is several hundred, um, not even inches, it like feet <laughs> display. And it's running content, super dynamic. It's filling the courtyard with color. I imagine there might have been sound. There's nobody there. <laughs> hmm. Like, who is this playing for? <laughs> Maybe you're there on the week and it's busier on the weekend. Per. Perhaps I will grant you that, but uh, yeah. Either way, it was a little surreal. You don't usually see uh, at least a reasonably sizable city with not a whole lot of activity going on. No, no, not unless it's like Sunday or something. Right. It's a city where literally everyone is an introvert. No one is willing to go out. <laughs> <laughs> that could be it. Oh, Matt, I didn't even think to mention we got to talk about your new venture in the podcasting. Yeah. First of all, I wanted to ask you, season 14, time for a podcast, still going strong? Yes. Still going, yeah. Uh, We're in the middle of season 10 right now, so we've still (laughs) got five plus to go. And then there's the Winchester spinoff, and we're like, well, the story continues. We're probably (laughs) going to have to continue as well. Absolutely. we'll see when we get there. Uh, Yeah, so that's still going. We're having a lot of fun with that. And... For about two years, maybe like right after I did that, the guest spot with you guys, and then I did a couple of guest spots on uh, the Test of Time podcast, I really started getting the itch to talk about movies again. Mm -hmm. But then I was like, I don't think I can do two at once. I don't think I can do two (laughs) shows at once. So I just kind of kept pushing that down and then just held off as long as I could. And then I happened across this book in a bookstore. It was just... I had never heard of the the series before, but it's been out for like 20 years. It's called like the thousand and one movies you must see before you die. And I started flipping through it and I was like, I wonder if anyone's made a show about this. And someone did, but they abandoned it like a year ago and they only got like 40 some odd movies in. Hmm. And so I pitched the idea to my friend Allie and she had her own podcast for Supernatural as well. That's how we met. And so we just kind of threw ideas back and forth. You know, we started with that idea and we tried other, you know, thought up other ones. And then we settled on, let's take movies from that list and then add some of our own. And then let's come up with a list of like the worst movies ever made, which now that list is like over 800. (laughs) Um, And then let's watch one good movie and then try to bring in a movie that relates to it as the bad movie. So one, one movie each episode. So, like, we've done Back to the Future as a good movie, and then we did Time Chasers as a bad movie. Ah. (laughs) And, you know, the idea is like, well, do they hold up as a good or a bad movie? Or are there some movies that are considered good that are actually bad? Are there some movies that are considered bad that are actually good? So we kind of just kind of go through the history of certain movies, and and then we, we lay our judgment down. Is it a good yeah. movie or a bad movie? And that's the show. Good movie, bad movie. Very good. Very cool. Now, you, you got to tell a story about Time Chasers, though. You had to take go the extra mile. I did. So, yeah, I first saw Time Chasers as a Rift Tracks Live. And even with a Rift Tracks Live, that movie's kind of hard to watch. It really is. Because it just drags. And I think they even cut some parts out. But I know it, it was. Uh, it, it really became a cult classic when it became an MST3K. And then I've watched that too. But I couldn't find a streaming or free or even pirated copy of it without one of those over it. <laughs> so I had to buy it. 
<laughs> I put down twenty dollars <laughs> to get a copy of Time Chasers, which didn't even come in a plastic case. It came in a cardboard slip. Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> but now I have for Time just Chasers a disc in a sleeve. <laughs> yeah, in a cardboard sleeve. So back there on my movie shelf is a very thin copy of Time Chasers. <laughs> That is hilarious. Uh, I, I feel like you need to frame and hang that one. I mean, and like it, the best part, it's in the it's in the cardboard slip, mm. and you see the little hole punch of where it would have been on like the hook at like the video store. <laughs> <laughs> Spared no expense. <laughs> so someone picked that up at a, at a family video closeout. <laughs> yeah, but that one, that episode uh, will be dropping like. By the time this episode airs, it'll have already dropped. But like you know, we we look into the history of movies and we we try to give as much like context and backstory. We found out that the guy who made that movie, pretty much at the age of nineteen, picked up a camera and said, "I'm going to be a filmmaker now." Did not go to film school, and that was his first uh, full length feature film. Since then, has made like twenty some odd other movies. Oh, wow. Still makes movies. So we're we're learning all this. We're like, all right, dude, this was a bad movie. But good on you. You're living the dream. Right, yeah. I mean, that's mostly what our show is about, is just celebrating that you went out there and did something. Yeah. <laughs> so we were kind of impressed. Like, we, we both came to the same conclusion. It was like, we almost gave it to you. We almost said it was a good movie, just because you, you did what you could with what little you had. I just looked him up to see what other films he had. I was curious, like, really he's made that many? Have I seen any? Right. <laughs> and I had. I had seen Accelerator. I saw that a couple oh. years ago, which is like his other time travel movie, which came out in like 2020. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah, I'm looking. I don't think I've seen any of these, which surprises me, actually. Accelerator was a movie. Somebody was like, you have to watch this. I just saw it. It's terrible. And so we all sat down and watched it together, like in the middle of the pandemic. And we were just sort of like, what is this? It was the, like nonsensical action scene after nonsensical action scene. <laughs> I didn't even know it was the same guy until I was researching time chasers. I was like, wait a minute. I think I need to dig up 1999's Icebreaker. Right. It's got Sean Astin, Stacey Keach, and Bruce Campbell. I've seen that. <laughs> and that's the thing is he like he's he's worked with people that you know like like I said he's living the dream so I'm just sort of like I tip my hat to you sir you did good <laughs> oh and funny thing with Icebreaker too um, I've seen it both rift and unrift it was a rift tracks uh, um, I'm sure extravaganza <laughs> wonder if maybe maybe I have seen that one I wonder if I've seen that one rift tracks. Mm. Very good, though. I I've been enjoying it. I've been listening to your show. It's a it's a good time. You have a nice chemistry with your co-host and everything. And uh, yeah, I just listened to your uh, Back to the Future episode, which you were really jonesing on talking about. I, yeah, I'm amazed we didn't talk about that when you were on the show. I know we brought it up because we did our episode on time travel in general, and then we picked kind of like lesser known time travel movies. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah, yeah, because we did. Um, oh, what was the the one you you brought up? Um, Primer was it? Primer. Primer. I was like, it starts with a P. What is it? <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, I, I love Primer. And then, what was yours? You had one. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't recall. It must not have fit into our entire year of uh, time travel. <laughs> Let's see. Maybe did I pull out the original time machine? Perhaps the 1960 time machine. Oh, no, I know. We, I, I got the list here. Time After Time. That was a really good ah, movie. Ah, there you go. I, I enjoyed that one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Primer and Time After Time. But right. yeah, no, I, I pretty much went into recording that episode with Allie. I, I told her, I was like, this is going to be a love letter to Back to the Future, and I don't <laughs> care how long it takes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, anybody else have anything else they want to mention? I don't think there's... I, I haven't watched anything else that uh, of note that I feel like I need to actually talk about. <laughs> I've watched plenty, but nothing I need to really talk about. No, nothing. I've just been like rewatching a lot of stuff. Like I, I just kind of like have things on that I've like watched two or three times already in the background when I'm like making dinner or having lunch, kind right. of thing. Right now, it's the pick the few things from some of the streaming services that are gonna disappear. Um, 
in, in a bit because everybody's kind of coming cutting back on their their catalog um and i know there's one i'm hoping to catch before the week is out because i think it's gonna go away it's called the princess it's a it's actually an action film where it kind of turns it on the ear the uh the heroine is the princess is the one saving her own skin through the entire film so it's a i've seen it once i just want to watch it again before they take it off Hmm. right yeah, I've seen a, a couple of different uh, people complain about uh, some series or movies mm-hmm. that they were watching that suddenly aren't there anymore. And I, I commented, it was like physical media, <laughs> except no substitutes. If it's something that you want to make sure that you can watch again or finish or whatever, get a disc because the streaming services are not always going to be there for you. Yeah. You can't even buy, quote-unquote, buy a movie or a series on a streaming service and expect it to be there forever. Right. I, for, if I can't find a legitimate copy of it somewhere, I've actually taught myself how to make my own Blu-ray. Mm-hmm. Oh. I've done that for a few different shows where I'm just sort of like, I can't trust that it's going to stay on this service, and I can't find it anywhere. I can't find, like, an import or anything like that. The library has been my saving grace. Mm-hmm. Uh, I use the uh, those the interlibrary loans, so anything, if it exists in Ohio, mm. I can get it and I can watch it. All right, well, I tell you what, if we don't have anything else, let's go ahead and take a short break. We'll let, play a promo for another podcast. And when we get back, we will talk about 1988's Willow. Rotten Tomatoes, Metacritic, IMDb, and Letterbox all want to stick a simple rating on what we watch. But where's the nuance in that? A popular movie doesn't always age well, and who cares if the critics didn't like it? We here at Good Movie, Bad Movie believe every film has an audience. So join us for the good, the bad, and the so bad it's good, such as The Godfather. Back to the Future. Gili. Jaws. Young Frankenstein. Manos, The Hands of Fate. Killer Clowns from Outer Space. And Plan 9 from Outer Space. New episodes every other Monday, wherever you get your podcasts. You can find us on Instagram at GoodMovieBadMoviePod or write to us at GoodMovieBadMoviePod at gmail.com. Or join us on our Discord server by searching Good Movie, Bad Movie. The cream of the crop and the box office flops. It was a different time. It was a time of destiny. A time when a child could tip the balance between good and evil. Why, with my powers, with the strength of my great army, can you not find one little child? A time for an unlikely hero named Willow. Tell her I'm not gonna let anything happen to the baby. We gotta get that baby to somebody. I'm somebody. A time of scoundrels. What goes on here? Uh oh. And a time of rebels. You are great. You're a great warrior and a swordsman. And you're ten times bigger than I am, stupid. Find the child. Find the child. It was a time when courage could be found where you'd least expect it. A time when unearthly powers raged and good men risked their lives. A time of great adventure.
from the creator of Star Wars and the director of Cocoon, Willow. Willow is a 1988 fantasy film directed by Ron Howard. The screenplay was written by Bob Dolman, based on the story written by producer George Lucas. And the film was executive produced by Steven Spielberg. A young Nelwyn farmer, an aspiring sorcerer named Willow U- Ufgood, Ufgood. Ufgood, embarks on a journey to return a Daikini baby who was found by his family in the river to her own people. While on this adventure, he discovers that this child is destined to overthrow the evil Queen Bevmorda. He now has to protect her from the Queen's soldiers and find the sorceress Finn Rizel. All of this is made a little easier when Willow befriends rogue swordsman Mad Mardigan. The film star is young Warwick Davis as Willow, the uh, diminutive and kind-hearted farmer. Val Kilmer portrays Mad Mardigan. Joanne Whaley plays the warrior princess Sorsha, who is the daughter of the evil queen, but develops a complicated relationship with Mad Mardigan. And Jean Marsh is Queen Bev Morda, the powerful sorceress who seeks to kill the baby Alora. Now you requested this film, you wrote to us and requested this thing be added to our our series there, Matt. And I, I admitted when you wrote that and I was talking to Tom, I thought this was just one of those like classics that for some reason I never got around to watching. And I would assume it wasn't just a pretty film, but it was a really great film or something like that. So I was really interested why you thought it would fit into our, uh, our series. And before I go into my thoughts on the film and everything, I would like to hear your thoughts on, on that. Willow is one of those movies, like I have this whole batch of movies that I couldn't tell you when I first saw it. It was one of those movies that like, uh, growing up in New Jersey, we had uh, WPIX New York and they would always have their Sunday afternoon or Saturday afternoon movie. And they had like a few dozen different movies that would be in that rotation and Willow was one of them. So I've probably seen this movie like three or four dozen times. <laughs> wow. Um, you know, it's like, it was like that and like the Michael Keaton Batman and all the Indiana Jones movies and Star Wars and all Back to the Future, all those things just on a loop for years of my life. And I don't know when I first saw this. I just know it's always been a part of my life. But then you grow up and people are like, oh, what are some of your favorite fantasy movies? And I go, Willow. And they're like, what's Willow? And that's like been the story of my life is like most people I have encountered have never heard of this movie and it kind of got made. It didn't do terrible, but then it just kind of got lost to time. Oh, interesting. Yeah. See, I've always known about Willow. It's always been kind of like on that list, that, that magical list that uh, keeps growing and never ends, but it's always been on that list of ones that I was going to catch up with and, and watch at some point. But yeah, I thought it was just this classic that everyone knew about and everyone loved, and I just hadn't watched it. I I always take it as there, people are essentially in two camps of, yeah, it's fine, I don't care, or I'm obsessed with it. I don't really hear a lot of hate. Like I've known people who've watched it and they go like, oh, I kind of remember that movie. And then there's people like me who are like, no, you don't understand. This is the movie that introduced me to high fantasy and Mm. I'll die for it. (laughs) Uh, uh, That might be a little extreme, Matt. (laughs) Tom, was your experience with the film different from either one of us? Uh, I I do remember having seen this. It wasn't a a theater watch for me, but... uh, but I remember catching it, yeah, probably as a rebroadcast, uh, and, and for us it was WXIX, um, and I, that's probably where I caught it, I, unless my parents had managed to rent that one for one reason or another. Um, but I count this one in the category of imminently forgettable. Um, <laughs> that's, yep. Yeah, because... Uh, like, I could remember having seen it. I remembered essentially what the gist of it was. And watching it again, like, it's almost out of my brain as quickly as I consumed it. And I only just watched it yesterday. <laughs> it gives me no feels whatsoever. It doesn't excite me in any way. It's just kind of there. 
And I'm, it, it, it's actually kind of disappointing for me. I did. It took me till I watched it now and read up a little bit about it now to realize that Ron Howard, George Lucas, and Steven Spielberg are all tied to this thing, and I just couldn't care less. <laughs> <laughs> It didn't feel like it had a presence for me. I was literally today years old when I found out that Mad Mardigan is one word. Yep. <laughs> yep. <laughs> it's not a, It's not an adjective. <laughs> well, yeah, no, I kept thinking, and, and uh, forgive me, Matt, I, I, I know this one is the one you would die for. We, we can pick up lightsabers later and actually battle for this. Uh, but, but, like, because I just recently saw that Mad Mardigan is a single word, it now explains why everyone said it so <laughs> many times. If, if Willow didn't say Mad Mardigan every other word, especially by the time you got to the midpoint on, then he didn't say anything at all. <laughs> he just kept, like, oh, Mad Mardigan. You could turn a drinking game out of that thing. <laughs> Yeah, this was this was in fact a first time watch. I had a sneaking suspicion that I would start watching this and go, "Oh, I've seen mm-hmm. this." It nothing. I it it never popped up. I I never saw it on a Saturday matinee or anything. I don't know how I missed this one. If it was on television, I never caught it. Uh, so this was a first time watch for me, and I'm watching it and. I'm feeling a little bit like you're like Tom here is that it's, it's fine. It's, it's, it's fine. Um, I, I was thinking maybe this was one of these films where depending on when you saw it was yep. when was kind of like, will you die on the hill? Because you saw it when you were 10 and you thought it was incredible. And so you're always going to think it was incredible. Yeah. That's me. Yeah. Yeah, we'll probably never unseat you from that. We're not even going to try. <laughs> no, absolutely not. And that's the uh, thing I've learned is, like, I can't make people see it that way. And I think because, you know, it's derivative of so much that, like, you've you've seen this movie before you've seen this movie. I mean, not only is it derivative of so many other high fantasy stories, George Lucas just dec- decided to come along and go, I'm just going to do Star Wars again. Yeah. yeah. I'm just going to set it in thing. this world. <laughs> That was the first thing I thought of is watching this is like George Lucas apparently had two good, two good ideas. He had uh, American graffiti and he had star Wars. He had, is it Indiana Jones? Oh, okay. Good he point. wrote a lot of that. Yeah. But this definitely has uh George Lucas written all over it. And I, I think you can feel a little bit of Spielberg's presence in the film as well. Uh, certainly in some of the more lighthearted moments. Yeah. You know, it's like instead of E.T. in a dress, you get Val Kilmer Mm -hmm. (laughs) in one. Um, This had all the Lucas trademarks. You know, it had the farm boy with dreams of adventure, the scoundrel turned hero, a comedic duo, albeit a much less lovable uh, duo. Mm -hmm. I really, and that's probably, I'd say a good 40% of why I couldn't bring myself to like this film more than I do is the brownies. I despise uh, those two characters. I love Kevin Pollock as as rule. He's no. so I love him. They uh, are the Jar Jar Binks times two. <laughs> yeah, I'm going gonna go with Chris on this, uh, Matt, because uh, I, I and I wanted to because I love Kevin Pollock, but yeah. that wasn't really Kevin Pollock. That, I was amazed that was him. I saw that name like. That that can't. That's not who I'm thinking of. <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't find them effective as comic relief because well and almost redundant because i mean we already have uh, decided that there there is an entire village if not all around the globe little people are like a dominant thing like they have their own culture their own existence that they, they, there's a derogatory term for them and then we're going to introduce even smaller people? Yes. <laughs> like, why? <laughs> well, they, they provided comedy relief where I don't feel comedy relief was necessary. Right. Yes. And we are already getting it with somewhat with uh, Mad Mardigan sure, and yeah. his exploits. I, I agree with that. Yeah, I'm not sure the point of the brownies other than, well, I, I just don't have a point. That, <laughs> 
they were a plot. They were a plot device through and through. Like pretty much anything that they do that's significant moves the plot forward. Did they do something significant? And I asked that legit. I just watched it last night. I don't remember anything that they did other than just introduce themselves so that um, Willow can get the wand. Other than right. that... <laughs> yeah, well, they, they goof around and spray Mad Mardigan with the, the love dust. Oh, right. Yeah. Which is a plot point. Plot, yeah. That's, that moves okay. a plot point. That, they that's they re-abduct Alora, which and bring her and go back by Willow, and then they, like tie Willow down like it's Gulliver's Travels and so that's when he learns this is a Laura Dannon and she's important she's not just some Daikini baby like she, the fate of the universe rests on her shoulders he doesn't find that out if the brownies don't take her and, and bring Willow to, to their village and, and meets the, the sorceress Yeah, well, I would have been happy with the whole brownie thing and the, to the village and everything and then they could have and left them leave. behind <laughs> Right. <laughs> that would be just another another creature in this in this unnamed world is fine and we know they exist and that's I didn't need him to come along. <laughs> well, yeah, and then when, and that's fair cuz I think uh you might even agree Matt that uh after all of that when they come along they're trying to be the comedy relief but they don't actually provide any decent um movement in the story other than like just the, being like moving the plot forward yeah at, at the times they do other than that yeah they're just hanging out yeah would you consider this a family film a kids film i mean what was the audience for this film do you think i or what was the intended audience right. i i think it was intended to be a family film i think you know they were trying to put you know, that's why they throw the romance in there. That's why the action is in there. But then they've got characters like the Brownies being fun for the little kids. And, you know, you've got Willow being the hero who'll rise to the occasion that just about anybody can be like, I can relate to that or I can or I aspire to be that. Like all those different little things. I So, yeah, I think it was trying to be a family film. I think it was trying to be a little bit too much it, of one or the other at times because... I think you can be a family film without going so low as to having characters like the Brownies. Yeah. Because that's going to turn the adults off that are trying to watch this thing. The kids might be loving it, but the adult, that's when the adults start clocking out. <laughs> <laughs> but, but then without them, do you have the little kids? Right. Right. I think you'd have to get the kids on like the fun and the magic and all that stuff and, you know, try trying to get them in, in how you got them with Star Wars. Mm hmm. Which which was an accident. <laughs> Star Wars got everybody by mistake. <laughs> yeah, good point. Uh you mentioned Star Wars and you know, Star Wars is of course kind of groundbreaking in its visual effects and everything. We have this movie pretty much to thank for a technology that we practically have on our phones now. This is really kind of the birth of the morphine technology. Mm -hmm. uh, ILM was developing it and used it in this film, I think, for the first time. I, I love every single one of those sequences. I think they still look really good, um, especially like the, the, that one where um, she becomes the crow. I'm like, that yeah. was done really well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's just amazing that you, you see the uh, the beginnings of that technology. And like I said, you can get an app for your phone now and morph yourself with, with photos and things. And now it's commonplace. It's in television. It's on our phones. It's in our games. And here it is used for the first time in film. I thought that was that was actually pretty cool. Yeah, and I think that's what falls into the whole it looks pretty. Because I, I feel like pretty much mm -hmm. everything in this movie visually holds up. Oh, absolutely. No, the production value is through the roof on the film. I think it looks fantastic. The cast is fantastic. Uh, I mean, they, they collect probably the biggest group of uh, little people since Wizard of Oz Yeah. Uh, for this film. I, I almost wish it was just them through the entire film. Mm -hmm. I would have loved to have seen them It'd almost be like a... Um, oh, shoot. What's the name of the film? Um, Lord of the Rings. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> yes, 
but it's not what I was trying to think. No, of. I know, uh, but I we threw just that in we there. just watched it last year, Tom. Um, oh, jeez, that doesn't all the other, it down at all. <laughs> the other uh, time bandits. Time bandits. Okay. Oh, I think it would have been fun had the adventure really just fallen the group of uh, of Nelwins, you know, throughout the film instead of just one and without Mad Mardigan and all that. I mean, Mad Mardigan is a character I don't think I would ever cut because I love <laughs> Val Kilmer in this role. I think he nails every single joke. I I love the whole because you know he is the Han Solo of this movie, mm. but like in the original Star Wars, Han Solo is a jerk until the very end. Whereas in this, they were like, we're gonna make him lovable the moment he gets out of the cage. <laughs> because he genuinely cares about Alora. You see him like baby talk with her later in the movie. You see how he's like, all right, we're going to put up this fight because I've never stood for anything in my life. And like, that's only like two thirds away in the movie. There's still a lot of movie left after that fight. And it's just like, I, I, I wonder if he took all those lessons of Han Solo and was like, let's make him a good guy from the jump. Mm hmm. Make make the scoundrel just part of his past but that we don't actually see. Yeah. And the moment he gets a sword in his hand, he is fantastic. He does handle the sword really well. With, with I mean, granted, most of it is just showing off and doing the flips without cutting his hand off and everything. But, yeah, he throws himself into it. Yeah. And who doesn't love the snowball gag? Snow. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> the snowball where he's go where they're going down yeah, the mountain down the and then he falls yeah, off the yeah, shield yeah. sled and then a giant like it's straight out of Looney Tunes. It's ridiculous. It doesn't belong and I love it every time. And you see his <laughs> you see his feet sticking out the sides and I'm just sort of like it's funny. <laughs> it's just funny. <laughs> the, the the cast for the film was fantastic. Val Kilmer Val Kilmer, you know, watching him in this film, it just made me think, you know, he's an actor that just never really found his niche, I think. Yeah. I can't decide if he just, did he just not have the I'm a star or I'm a headliner quality? Was he really, would his career have been better if he had just been that supporting, that supporting actor? Or I think that is where his strength lies. Because when you look at, a number of the movies where he was the lead, you're just sort of like, okay, thanks. <laughs> yeah, he doesn't have a whole lot of presence all unto himself. I didn't dislike The Saint, which is really the only film I can think of that he's like the star. There was I'll, his that, Batman movie, which was right. okay. terrible. Okay. <laughs> it's there. They filmed it. <laughs> yeah. It exists. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, I paid money to see it. <laughs> yeah, but when I think of like movies that I love and roles of his that I love, yeah, he's the support. Like he's great as Iceman in Top Gun. I, I, mm -hmm. you know, he gives the greatest comeback in movie history, which is just to bite his teeth. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it was probably one of his early films. Um, Top Secret. He was the star, but it was pure comedy and a and a, and a spoof and a farce. Maybe that's where he should have you know, focused his his energy. I, I think he he could have been onto something as kind of a charming comedic guy, mm -hmm. but pre pretty enough to to look at and, and go ah, oh, but but more funny because he, his delivery is uh, when he does have something comedic, it's usually pretty decent. I mean. Actually, the only moment uh, out of that terrible Batman film, which doesn't even belong in the Batman film, but is the one endearing thing that Val Kilmer does, which is the one time Batman smiles. Hmm. He does his goofy, shit-eating grin because <laughs> the girl likes him. And... <laughs> and, and it didn't belong in that movie at all, but the, the way he did it, it was kind of endearing. I, 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 I remember that part fondly, and I hate that it was there. <laughs> <laughs> I think he actually gets top billing in this film, too, doesn't he? Yes. Yeah, Warwick, uh, I mean, the thing's named after his character, but Warwick didn't manage to get top billing. That's a little Warwick. wrong. <laughs> 
Warwick was only 18 when they made this movie. He was still a kid. Yeah, he was really young. In fact, he may have been 17 when they filmed it. I think he was right. 18 when the when film came, came out. out. So he was probably only 17 years old when he was filming the thing. Yeah, and he... Uh, have you ever seen his show, Life's Too Short? No, I haven't. It's, it's this brilliant comedy. It only ran for one season. It was uh, written and produced by Ricky Gervais. Um, <laughs> but Warwick is the star, and he's playing a fictionalized version of himself. And he's hired a film crew to make a documentary on his life, because in this world, Warwick Davis is an ass. Even though in real life he is like a sweetheart and everybody says the nicest things about him, but in this world he's a total ass. And like he goes to like conventions and he puts up all the posters of the movies he's been in, and people are like, Who were you in Star Wars? And he's like, I was Wicked the Ewok. Oh, we couldn't see your face. Oh, and then and he's like, Well, I was in Harry Potter. Who were you in that? And he was like, I was, you know, Professor Flitwick. And they were like, so a lot of prosthetics on your face. And he's like, well, I was in Willow. You can see my face in that. And they were like, what's Willow? <laughs> <laughs> the show is absolutely hilarious. And it's just all about how he's a jerk and like karma always comes back around to bite him in the ass. And it's so, so funny. That's funny. Now I'll have to check that out. I think he was really good in this film. 17 years old, he carries himself like a, like a man. He carries yeah. himself like a much older uh, person. I mean, he's obviously playing someone, or we're assuming would be. We don't know how Nell wins work, but right, right. we assume he's playing someone older than than his actual the actor's age. I think he does fantastic. He's one of those actors where it's unfortunate that in the '80s he couldn't have found a legitimate career not under the prosthetics and the, and makeup yep. and films. Yeah, and one of his other uh, movie roles, I didn't find this out till years after I saw the movie, is he is the man inside Marvin the Robot in the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy movie. Oh, is he now? Oh, I didn't know. I, did. I don't remember. Oh, I do. <laughs> yes, I remember reading that. Yes. Yeah, and and I remember, like, he. people always said that, like, he never asked for a break, even though he was overheating in the suit. <laughs> he never asked what when when is lunch. And like, and you know, and there's like these clips of like, you know, the helmet off and he's just there with a big smile on his face being like, I'm doing a movie. It's like, you don't even know he's in it. You never hear his voice. He took the part. It's awesome. No, he's definitely, um, he's an actor I would love to see come around to a convention. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, he'd, he'd be brilliant to hear the stories. And he's probably got some real stories to tell because, you know, actors sometimes forget there's people in the suits. Yes. <laughs> yeah, people were probably like, they didn't know that that wasn't a toy robot, and they just kept talking. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm pretty sure Kenny Baker probably told stories like that, being an R2-D2. Oh, yeah. I, I imagine uh, Warwick Davis has a few to tell as well. Yeah. But no, he, he is a really great actor in this film. And yeah, you... I mean, now, uh, what's the uh, the actor that... I keep saying this. I keep thinking of them, and then I can't think of their name. Oh, Peter Dinklage? Dinklage, yes. Peter Dinklage. Love Peter Dinklage. Yeah, he's a very good actor. Right now, in the 2000, you know, aughts, 2020s, someone like Peter Dinklage can get a, a role. He can be in a movie. He can be himself. He can be without prosthetics. He doesn't have to be an alien. He doesn't have to be, you know, a, a robot or anything like that. I don't think you could do that much in the 80s. You had to be the elf. You had to be the, the mystical something or other. And I think it's a shame because I think Warwick Davis really could have had a, a he could have had like Dinklage's career 30 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, Hollywood was not in that frame of mind. <laughs> no, no, it was not. Yeah, but he he's just, I think he's carved out like a good career for himself. And, you know, he's, he's friends with, with, George Lucas and Steven Spielberg right. and Ron Howard. It's like he's in great company. Like I think they'll always look out for him and he'll 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 always have his little corner of Hollywood and he'll always do a great job with it. And I love his comedy. I think he's so funny. Yeah, I'll definitely have to check out the show. He just sounds like he has a great sense of humor and everything and Yeah. Hey. And yeah, I don't think he'll ever go hungry. Right. <laughs> now Matt, you mentioned early on that this film it didn't do awful. It it made its budget and then some. Yeah. 
in the theaters and worldwide and everything, but it wasn't the big hit that everyone was hoping for. Yeah, uh, I remember reading it was a $35 million budget, and it made about $137 million back, which, like, not bad. Right. That seems, like, really good. Yeah. yeah. Um, but they were hoping for E.T. money, is mm-hmm. what I remember George Lucas having said. It's like, okay, didn't do that. And I could see that, because, you know, like, at this point, the original Star Wars trilogy was over. Um Indiana Jones was wrapping up. They were probably thinking, like, is this going to be the next big trilogy from the mind of George Lucas? And it just, it just didn't have that box office push to justify doing a second one. I even remember at the time they were doing heavy merchandising. Like they yeah. really wanted to, they wanted this to be a toy line. They wanted it to be very popular with kids, and it just wasn't. Well, I wonder if maybe the uh, the sword and sorcery thing was getting a little long in the tooth. The eighties were pretty rife <laughs> yeah. with fantasy films. I I was looking at a list, to pull, pulling up different films and everything, and going back to like nineteen eighty. We've got now. Granted, not all these films are necessarily good. Some of them are absolutely terrible. Some arguable. You know, you can argue one way or the other. But we start. Uh, 1980, we have things like Hawk the Slayer and Excalibur in 81. Uh, the Beastmaster, of course, in 82. Uh, Dark Crystal in 82. Never Ending Story in 84. Uh, just fantasy. Not necessarily really sword and sorcery, but fantasy. Uh, Lady Hawk in 85. Okay, oh, forget about Conan the Barbarian in 82. Mm-hmm. Uh, Labyrinth didn't do terribly well by 86. Princess Bride in 87 is probably the one that did the best out of all of them. And that was really more romance and comedy than it was sword and sorcery or anything. Right. So I just really wonder if the, the genre was tired by 1988. Fair, yeah. Because I don't, I can't think of anything, and I couldn't find any real good representation of this sort of film that came after 1988 for a long time. Oh, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah I don't think you could find a decent fantasy film. At least until we get into the Lord of the Rings. Uh huh. Right. Exactly. And, and you so totally maybe forgot just... the Ator films. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah. So maybe it was just a kind of a combination of things of it being George Lucas telling the the same story that everyone had seen and doing so in a genre that everyone was maybe a little tired of. And yeah. I, maybe just a, had a lot of different things going against it at that time. Maybe if this had come out pre-Star Wars, you know, if, if it could have, maybe if he had focused on this instead of Star Wars, can you imagine the world we live in now? Right. <laughs> we wouldn't have lightsabers. We would all have, like, little messed up curly wands and we'd have the glowy wands. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think that's what really did in Willow was that, that wand just looked like they picked up some ratty stick on the ground. (laughs) Apparently from what I read, it was an actual stick. (laughs) I do not doubt. They got the set and they were like, you brought the wand, right? (laughs) I thought you were bringing the, we got it. We got it right here. We found it. it. (laughs) Yeah, I think they, at first it was just a stick, but as production progressed, they realized they needed to make something sturdier. And so they, they, <laughs> We're going to have a continuity. Something. Why does it look like a different stick? Like, yeah. <laughs> we need a mold of that stick. It, it's, it's one of those morphing wands. Right. Every time we morph her, the wand morphs? <laughs> yeah, the, the stick changes. Exactly. I, I've heard worse. <laughs> But uh, the other person I want to talk about is uh, mm-hmm. Joanne Whaley, because I yep. love her as Sorsha. I love Sorsha's arc, because you can kind of see from the beginning of the movie that she's, like, not really on board with her mom's plan of, like, killing a baby. <laughs> but she's just sort of like, you're in charge. And you, you kind of see her, like, waver on that from time to time. But, like, she's she's following mom's orders, and every army that has tried to stand up to her mother has been decimated and it's not until mad mardigan comes along and is like one manning himself against that army that she's like okay i can switch sides now somebody's standing up to her 
Mad Mardigan, even though his his love for her may have been magically induced or whatever, but that was the that was just the excuse she needed yes. to finally uh, turn her back to her mom. Yes, and I know it's not explained well in the movie, but there is a backstory that uh, her father was a very good, kind, and decent king. When they get oh. to that castle and everybody's frozen in ice, yeah. he's one mm-hmm. of them. And when the movie oh, ends and everybody's seeing Willow off, there's this old guy with long white hair. That's her father. Oh, and interesting. And okay. Bav Morta used a spell to make him fall in love with her just so she could become queen. Wow. And where does this backstory come from? Yeah. Um, you got to read the novelization? This, <laughs> it was like this companion book that came out not long after the movie. Um, mm-hmm. And they've, they've just kind of, it was one of those things that, you know, George Lucas just kind of kept expanding the lore and then more of it came out as time went by and then the show started. And so they released more information and things like that. But yeah, so her father was actually a good, kind and decent king and she takes after him more. So seeing how her mother is, is just kind of conflicts with that like inner voice she has. I like that. That makes a little bit more sense because this was definitely a romance that only happens in the movies. It's, right. I just met you. I'm in love. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, actually, the, you bring up an interesting point that kind of ties in with one of the reasons why I think I find this forgettable is... Chris, you even brought it up when uh, what do they what do they call their li- little people again? Because I have. no wins. Yes. So we we are set in a fantasy world where we are not provided a whole lot of context because even the story uh, about the baby um, and the fact that the the queen wants to destroy her. We don't have a whole lot enough backstory or understanding of why, why all of this is. Don't we get kind of a text scrawl at the beginning? You you get a little text scrawl, but I mean, it it, it sets up literally what we've already spoken about. The baby is supposed to have a mark that means that somehow she is going to dethrone the bad queen. Now... It's kind of interesting that there is such a, 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 a story being told, seeing as how, how long has the queen been where she's at? Like, these things tend to usually come from, like, hundreds of years of legend and lore. And this one's got maybe a date of 20, 30 years <laughs> tops. Mm. So, um, so, yeah, we're not given a whole lot of a, a whole why all of a sudden there would be a child that might be born with a marking that that will now signify this, but we don't know what's supposed to even happen. Like, at what point is said baby supposed to do something bad to the queen? And how? Uh, where are we going with this? It's a very vague prophecy it because the whole idea really is like, is. oh, uh, you know, a child will be born that will bear this mark. And so she collects all the pregnant women and they're like, does she just keep? Does, is that like an ongoing thing? Like, if you have hmm. a baby, it's going to be in the dungeon of this woman's castle. <laughs> well, and this hits on some of the more funny things that happen, like in science fiction stuff, let alone fantasy. Is the world is way smaller? Like, there's a whole globe out there, but we are really only talking about this one little niche of a place. So when you say something like, uh, this child will be born uh, and, and all that, where? <laughs> <laughs> well, next like, door. We don't, <laughs> yeah, like, we don't know. How, how is this happening within your realm of possible control, well, even? We, we don't know what this world is like. Exactly. And not that I need to. It's just when we go on these routes of prophecy and all that, that apparently linger on very thin threads and might Hmm. not even be that old. What are are we talking about? Where? Like, I need a little bit more backstory so that I can buy in to everything you're about to kind of give me. Uh, I think that's where the, uh, the story in this film falls into that whole family and child's story. Sure. You don't need all those details. You just say that and that that's good enough to get the, the story moving and that that's it. And, and if, 
And if you're making a ch children's story, that would make sense. But the way that they wanted this, they marketed it and all that, they wanted this to have more of a life than it had. So I, to that, yeah, I mean, you need a little bit more. I know, I'm being really hard on this one. No, I don't think so. I think you make fair points. Um, and I, I take it from that point of view of like, it's one of those like fun, mm -hmm. um, it, it's that thing that people write about a lot with, with villains. Cause like, if she didn't do anything, she'd be alive. Like if she didn't collect all the pregnant women right. and didn't try to have this baby killed, she wouldn't have died. <laughs> Right. <laughs> yeah, it, these prof these prophecies become very much self fulfilling. I like if you've right. done nothing, no one right. would know any different. But, but her her ego is so fragile, and she's so insecure and so afraid of losing power that that's what causes her to lose power. And I I, I like when villains are written that way of just sort of like it was your own damn fault. Mm -hmm. We need to apply this to our political system currently, but we'll have to figure out how that works. <laughs> we need a prophecy, we need a baby, and we can do it. <laughs> oh, this could work. I have ideas. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anything else anybody wanted to bring up on the film? Yeah, one of the, I think maybe the thing I love about this movie the most is uh, James Horner's score. Really? Yeah, I really, I really, he to me is one of those uh, film composers who just kind of flies under the radar. But like when you look, like I, I love the music in this movie. And then when you like look through his body of work, you're like, he did that and that. Yeah. Like he did Feel the Dreams, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, The Rocketeer, Braveheart, oh, yeah, Jumanji. No, he, he has solid stuff, but uh, this one. The music was I actually like one, one of the things that I had a hard time with because I felt like it it wanted to swell to a moment and then would peter out. I honestly, I'm sitting here thinking, I can't even think of like what was the Willow theme. I mean, there was no. Yeah. Oh right, because that's. And I think I know that more because it was used in like many films that came after, <laughs> at least if not in the films and the trailers and that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. It, it, and that's maybe it's because of that. It, it has a generic kind of feel to it. It's like it, it's like you could have yeah. pulled it off of a shelf that that said fantasy themes parts one through five. Yeah, I think it, it, in this. This is another one of those. If if it were the first time I had heard this that thing, yeah, I might feel differently. Sure. But I just like Tom said, now it feels like that's the, the the song you can pull down from YouTube to put to your video or something. <laughs> it was it was several years ago, and I hadn't rewatched this movie in a while. And I was like walking through the grocery store and I was whistling that song. And I was like, what <laughs> is this song? And I can't get out of my head. Willow and I just kept, wormed you. That's yeah, awesome. I couldn't. And I just kept whistling it. And then finally I just went out loud. It's Willow. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the only way that you can cure yourself of an earworm is to go. That's it. <laughs> right. Yeah. I did put out the social media that we'd be watching this, mm -hmm. and this is another film where I was expecting to get many comments. We got one. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds right. That, to me, sounds absolutely right. Uh, on Facebook, uh, a good friend, Barry, he says, I love this movie. Saw it opening day and even read the Chris Claremont, George Lucas book trilogy, Shadow Moon, Shadow Dawn, and Shadow Star that was supposed to follow this one. Alongside Dragon Slayer and the director's cut of Legend, it's my favorite 80s fantasy. Nice. And he is definitely in your camp there, Matt. And now Matt has three books to go by. I might. <laughs> uh, you know, I will say the show that that just aired and unfortunately got canceled after one season, they had th a three-season plan. I like the show more. Really? The show is a lot of fun because, you know, there's a lot of, like, high fantasy shows going on. Like, you know, they... Wrapped up Game of Thrones a few years ago, but now they're doing that prequel. They've got the Witcher series. There's the Lord of the Rings series. 
But what really kind of separates this one is it's lighthearted. All those other ones are super serious, super, you know, those are adult shows. Whereas this, it's like you could put like the kids down and what, you know, everybody sit down and watch that show. And what I like about it is like, there's a handful of just moments where you're, where you're thinking like, did, did they break character or is that just how everybody is in this world? Like there's this part where somebody's asking Willow, you know, after you defeated Bad Morta and you won and you saved the, you know, saved everybody, what did you all do? And he just looks and he goes, we all went out and got pissed. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, was that in the script? Like, <laughs> That's fantastic. Yeah, we we mentioned that uh, when we were talking about this uh, last episode that this was coming up. Tom mentioned the, the the series and how that it was pretty much aired and then quickly canceled. Yeah, and yeah, we're we're just trying to figure out is this a beloved franchise or character when something like this happens that there's oh here's a series and that's probably one of the reasons why I thought oh okay obviously this film is beloved by many because they made a series. And then they immediately cancel that said series. So it's like, now I'm, I'm kind of with you, Matt. I'm like, does anyone know what this film is? <laughs> right. It's, it's beloved by the few who know it. To me, I put it in, it's in the camp of a cult classic. Like the people mm-hmm. who love it, love it. Right. And I'm one of them. And I think, I think everybody who loves it understands fully well they're in the minority. And we're all just kind of okay with that. But you made them. A- Excellent point, though, uh, and, and I think you might even get that out of Chris and I. Yeah, we're 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 dogging on it a little bit, but I don't think we hate it. No, right. absolutely not. No, I, I I liked it. It was fine. It's just it, it feels like one of the many 1980s fantasy films. Right. Yeah. So, and, and that's where I think it's funny that that it sits in this like, um, when you get a something where there's a controversy like you either love it or hate it but it is that you're at odds with each other there's a conflict about this film and that's how you can make more off of a property like that because love it or hate it you're going to get people drawn to talking about it and paying money to see stuff and all that and that's great in willow's case it it's a love it or eh and right. so there's no, there is no, there's no drama. There's no, there's no fight in anyone on this. Like you saying you love this, like you love it. We're in the eh category, but we're not going to go, okay, well, you're wrong and fight about it. There's no conversation. Like, okay, that sounds good. Yeah. <laughs> Which I feel is very befitting the movie because it's like, who, who wants to hate on lovable Willow? Like who right. wants to hate on war? Like, you're you're instantly the jerk in that conversation. <laughs> yeah. yeah, to come out as going, oh god, that's an awful film. Where's that hate coming from? You don't have enough in your life if that's where your world right. is. Shall we hear from some of the professionals? Yes, please, yes. Tom. What what did some of the critics have to say about this film? This was kind of a fun read to cu- pull some of these excerpts. Uh, I can't wait to read the one, but. Um, I, I, I can say honestly, going through this, um, Roger Ebert graded it amongst the highest, and that it was out of two and a half stars. So, so going from there, uh, from Empire, uh, Ian Nathan writes, uh, Willow is not without its charms. The effects are more than special. The set piece is suitably epic, but it just doesn't f- fulfill the promise of certain other films fantasy films and i think that goes toward the fatigue uh, but i'm dying to read this one and i hope i pronounce this word correctly from the chicago tribune dave Kerr, directed by ron howard and produced by george lucas the film seems to mark the final paroxysm of a genre the big budget fantasy adventure that dominated american filmmaking for a decade, but has recently been weakened by changing tastes. This goes to that comment. Altered economics and sheer exhaustion. It's less a movie than a collection of morbid symptoms. A labored, <laughs> arrhythmic narrative. A pathetic dependency on recycled themes and borrowed images. 
a sour, self-mocking humor that suggests the end is near. <laughs> so, <laughs> Dave had a lot to say. <laughs> but then um, we come over uh, to uh, Roger, one of, my, one of my favorites always. Uh, he writes, Willow is certainly not a breakthrough film to a mass audience, but is it at least successful children's picture? And he writes, I don't know. Its pacing is too deliberate. It doesn't have a light heart. That's revealed in the handling of some characters named the Brownies, represented by a couple of men who are about nine inches tall and fight all the time. (laughs) Maybe Lucas thought these guys would work like R2-D2 and C-3PO did in Star Wars, but they have no depth, no personalities, no dimension. They're simply an irritant at the edge of the frame. Touches like that will only confuse kids who know that good dreams do not need, do not have to be clever or consistent or expensive, but that they should never, ever make you want to wake up. <laughs> so, not a lot of critical love for, uh, for Willow. I actually found one, and when I saw this, I, I pointed at my screen, and I was like, it's me! Um, <laughs> <laughs> because uh, uh, Destin Thompson of the Washington Post wrote, the film is probably too much for young children and possibly too much for this, too much of the same for cynics, but any 6 to 13-year-old who sees this may be bitten by the movie bug for life. And that's when I was like, <laughs> me! <laughs> Yes. He got you. He knew your soul. It was an interesting watch. I'm I'm glad I finally kind of was able to scratch this off my uh, to watch list. It has been on there since 1988. I'm guessing, <laughs> <laughs> and it has been a blast having you come on and talk about it, Matt. Yeah, and you guys let me know if there's a good movie or a bad movie you want to come talk about. Oh, happy, happy to, to have oh, either well, of I, you. I I know I've got plenty of bad movies. <laughs> <laughs> See, then we can talk about Godzilla 98. <laughs> well, that's true, because then I can just rail on it. Exactly. <laughs> and then For we'll something. ask you, was it good or bad? <laughs> yeah, but then what is the good Godzilla movie to try? It can be anything. It, yeah. Yeah, it could be any kind of good we, we, movie. We could look at, like, the original. Right? Yeah, it could be fun. could be a way to go. Might be. And Matt that might be the way to go. Matt, I always recommend de- dipping into the uh, asylum uh, vault of films. <laughs> They're fantastic as giving you the alternate <laughs> of what would the, be a good movie, right down the to the busters. mock title. Yeah, all the mock busters. Yeah, yeah. the mock busters. They're they can be hysterical unto themselves. I've I've cooled on a lot of them because I feel like they've. Um, Overdone it, gone the way yeah, of Sci Fi Channel. Yeah, mm. yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, I, I totally get that. That's why you gotta, it's like a fine wine. You don't just guzzle it, you gotta take a little sip here and there. <laughs> <laughs> well, Matt, before we go, you gotta let everyone know where they can find you around the webs. Uh, I'm primarily on Instagram, but I did start a spoutable. Both of them are at movies at the mat. And I did start a Tumblr where I'm just kind of writing about any movie that I'm seeing for the first time. And so that's also movies at the Met, but there's hyphens in there because somebody took the other one. (laughs) (laughs) Movies, hyphen, at, hyphen. And where where can people find your podcasts? Uh, You can find my podcast at Season 14 Podcast. And then there's uh, at Good Movie, Bad Movie. Those are... Pretty much also Instagram, but I think, uh, yeah, season 14, we still have our Twitter. All right, sweet. Well, uh, I'll make sure to have links in the show notes and everything. Yeah. Now, next time on our next full show, uh, Tom and I will be ha- we'll have another guest with us yeah. as we talk. We jump back to 2008 to look at Speed Racer and filmmaker uh, Rick Ives, who we talked about his film Solid Rock Trust not that long ago. Uh, he's been Jones to come on and talk to, uh, about an actual movie with us. So he's going to join the show for that day. So that's going to be a fun time. It will be a good time. He was a fun interview. 
Yes, it was. And this is also going to be another first time watch for me. Oh, um, nice. Nice. Yeah, I've not seen again. It's just one of those I've been needing to watch it. I just haven't. I and now finally got the excuse I needed. And I can say I actually saw this in theater. Sweet. All right, cool. So we'll be back in two weeks with that, and I'm sure we're going to have something coming up in the feed in between to keep everybody busy. Uh, Thank you, everybody, for listening. Until we talk to you next time, bye. See you.